Hello and welcome to Church at Home. Whether it's your first time exploring faith, whether you're just new to us, or whether you're a regular at Maybridge just tuning in online, we're really glad you're here. My name is Chloe and I'm part of the staff team here at Maybridge Community Church. Do say hi in the comments, jump, tell us what you uh, liked about the service so far, it's great to hear from you. Um, like and subscribe to not miss out on any of our other church content and resources. And also, if you would like to give as part of your worship, you can do so by visiting maybridge.org.uk forward slash give or by scanning the QR code on the screen using the Give app. But of course, there's absolutely no pressure to give. Uh, this is something that Christians do as part of our worship. It's our way of acknowledging that uh, everything from Jesus is a gift and we want to partner with him and we're just excited to be part of the work that he's doing in the church, in the community and beyond. But like I say, there's no pressure to uh, join in with that or any other part of today's service for that matter. We're just really glad you're here with us trying it out and we hope you enjoy.
and welcome to today's talk. My name is Victoria and I'm part of the Maybridge Church family. We're continuing our in-depth look at the book of Matthew from the Bible and what it teaches us about being a follower of Jesus. We've made it as far as chapter 12 and here we continue to see reports of opposition, controversy and the rejection of Jesus, amid which Matthew is continuing to reveal to us the person of Jesus, who he is, and particularly in today's passage, by what power does he act? On the 1st of September 1939, Hitler's German forces invaded Poland, causing the start of the Second World War. Other countries then had to make a decision about which side they were on. Some didn't have a choice, Several, including Switzerland, decided to stay neutral. In total, more than 100 million personnel were involved from more than 30 countries around the world. In today's passage, Jesus has some tough information about choosing sides that's relevant to absolutely everybody in the world today. Let's read from Matthew chapter 12, verses 22 and 24. Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. The passage starts with a very brief, matter-of-fact report about a man having a demon removed from him. It's to the point because it's not the healing that's the main event, it's the teaching that follows that's important. But having said that, to our modern ears it's probably quite shocking to hear of demon possession talked about in such a throwaway manner and we probably need to just stop for a moment to remember that the grip of evil on a life is a very real phenomenon. According to the Christian worldview and many people's experience, there is a spiritual world out there. Just like in the time of Jesus, many today are fascinated by things like the occult and purposely try to seek out spirits of the dead. In several places in the Bible, God forbids contact with the spirit world. And if you think about this, the restriction wouldn't make sense unless there was something to be restricted from. In other words, there would be no need for God to restrict something that it was impossible to do anyway. And so, however intellectually difficult we find it, and as it occupied many of the healings of Jesus, it would be sensible not to rule out demon possession. In these first two verses, we see people's differing response to Jesus. With the ordinary people, we see faith battling with doubt. They're saying, could this be? The Greek that this is translated from means they weren't sure of the answer, but they were on the right track. They were on the verge of believing. They see that what Jesus is doing is good and they link it to their history and what they've been taught. The son of David was a royal title rooted in a prophecy to King David, one of the first kings of Israel and who was described as a man after God's own heart. The prophecy said that one of his descendants would be a king forever. And Jesus was indeed descended from the line of King David, but they couldn't quite work it out. Could this gentle healing man be the mighty warrior king that they'd been expecting? The other view we see is that of the religious leadership, the Pharisees. They wanted to separate themselves and be really holy, but instead had built a man-made religious system in which they wanted to call the shots and make life difficult for the ordinary people. They resented Jesus because he was getting all the attention and drawing people away from them. They were beginning to lose control. Now, the Pharisees were happy to acknowledge that Jesus performed exorcisms. Nobody could argue the man had actually been healed. The question was, by what power? Again, 
the Pharisees were trying to discredit Jesus, to get him into trouble. Practising magic under the influence of Beelzebul, another name for Satan, was a capital offence punishable by stoning. But it seems that in their desperation, they have lost sight of all logic. They were saying that the miracles Jesus was performing meant he wasn't from God, but he teamed up with the devil. Despite the obvious transparent goodness of what Jesus was doing, it was one thing to oppose Jesus, but quite another to call him the de evil. Let's see how Jesus replies. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself would be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can you enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Jesus starts by saying that the Pharisees just aren't making any sense. If Jesus is removing evil, how can he be using evil? Would demons cooperate with someone whose work was to ruin them? It would be like the British Army, Navy and Air Force all fighting against each other. They would just destroy their own country. Satan wants to build his kingdom, not destroy it. Why would he deliver a man who was already under his control? No, it's absurd. And the much more logical conclusion of these good acts is that it's God's power attacking Satan. Jesus also questions the Pharisees by saying, hang on a minute, your people also cast out demons. So if I'm using the devil, they must be too. In accusing Jesus, the Pharisees were actually condemning themselves. Verse 28 then is the central verse, the whole crux of the passage. The reality is Jesus is empowered by the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we believe that God is formed of three persons, a very difficult concept to get our heads around. But in this verse, you can see reference to all three persons. Jesus is talking, he's working by the power of the Spirit, and he mentions the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit is God's invisible power and influence, his continued presence on earth. The works are a sign that the reign and rule of God has arrived in the person of Jesus, and the proof is the miracles, all of which makes much more sense of what is happening. Jesus then uses an analogy of a house to represent the world, occupied at the moment by Satan, the strong man. We mustn't underestimate Satan. He is powerful. But Jesus enters, who is the strongest strong man, and defeats Satan, who he has complete power and authority over. Jesus then continues, Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Jesus speaks these really powerful words which can leave those listening as well as us in no doubt that we can't avoid making a decision about who Jesus is. Verse 30 should stop anyone in their tracks who thinks it's possible to be neutral about Jesus. Jesus makes it really clear that there is no hedging your bets or sitting on the fence there is no being Switzerland about him. We are either for him 
or against him. And not only that, we are either working with him in telling others or hindering his mission. Jesus then gives some sort of good news, bad news scenario. The good news is that all kinds of sins and even blasphemies, that's deliberately mocking God or treating him with disrespect, which is pretty bad, can be forgiven. That's really good news. It means however badly you've sinned against God, he will still forgive you. Then Jesus gives the bad news. Blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. This is a verse that has had many people worried. But as several theologians put it, those that fear they have committed this sin give a good sign that they have not. In other words, if you're worried about it, you won't have. When we think about this sin that can't be forgiven, we need to think about the context and the circumstances of when Jesus is saying it. And he's saying it after having been accused by the Pharisees of working by the power of Satan, by which the Pharisees are displaying the highest dishonour to God. The sin Jesus is talking about as being unforgivable is a hardened heart against Jesus, an unwillingness to repent. It's to try and ruin Jesus in the eyes of others or to stop others following him, something the Pharisees were particularly good at. Today, we might see it as atheists intentionally speaking against the work of the Spirit through the church's message with the aim of stopping others believing. Jesus is solemnly warning the Pharisees of the dangers in attacking the Holy Spirit. As long as anyone rejects the Spirit, they will not find forgiveness from their sins. It seems that Jesus knows the state of the Pharisees' hearts and that they may have reached the point where they have hardened their hearts beyond return. Interestingly, if we look elsewhere in the Bible, we see Jesus talking to a Pharisee called Nicodemus, who says this, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. You see, the Pharisees knew deep down that Jesus was from God, they just didn't want to admit it, to lose face or control of the people. And that was their sin. So the only unpardonable sin is the persistent, deliberate rejection of the Spirit's call with no recognition of sin. It's God's offer of forgiveness refused. Or as one translation of the Bible puts it, when you reject the Holy Spirit, you're soaring off the branch on which you're sitting, severing by your own perversity all connection with the one who forgives. Jesus goes on to emphasise that the day of opportunity for making a decision for him will not last. Ultimately, once a person has hardened their hearts to an irretrievable point in this life or has died without repenting, the chance for forgiveness has gone. Let's see what Jesus says next. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognised by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. An evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted and by your words you will be condemned. Jesus uses the analogy of trees and what any good gardener will know is that you don't need to dig up a tree and look at its roots to tell if it's healthy. You can tell the health of a tree by the fruit it produces, and so too with us. The Pharisees are bad trees. Their charges against Jesus have come from their own evil nature. Just listening to the Pharisees reveals the state of their hearts. 
And Jesus doesn't mince his words. He calls them a brood of vipers, strong language, and may not be something to copy if you're having a conversation with someone. But Jesus goes on to say that the health and attitude of our hearts can be told by our speech. And one day we will have to give an account for all the wrongful, hurtful words we have so spoken. A really sobering thought. So what does all this teaching of Jesus mean for us today? Well, first, Jesus is the Spirit King. Matthew has shown that Jesus is the true Son of God and he works by the power of the, and authority of the Holy Spirit. The presence of Jesus showed the arrival of the Kingdom of God, God's reign and rule on earth, and this should be a huge encouragement to our faith. Anyone who has committed their life to Jesus is part of the kingdom of God, the victorious side. Jesus has been judged in our place. We are not guilty of the unforgivable sin. Our sins have been forgiven and we have been made clean. If we follow Jesus, we too are anointed by the Spirit to do good's work, God's work. For 2,000 years, God's kingdom has been breaking in. It's not here totally yet, but wherever we're helping people in the name of Jesus, the kingdom is present and the kingdom will continue to forcibly advance until Jesus comes again. Secondly, are we for Jesus or against him? We saw at the beginning two groups of people coming to a decision about Jesus. The Pharisees, who were more blinded than the man that Jesus healed, are deciding against him. Some of the crowd are beginning to decide for him. Matthew's question to us as we read is, what's your decision? Are you for Jesus or against him? In our culture today, this doesn't sound very politically correct or inclusive. We live in a world that hates truth or people having to take sides. People often want to steer a line down the middle of the road to think of themselves as being broad minded. Many would not be openly for Jesus, but would say that they don't oppose him either. They may think that they can politely decline. But this is a dangerous position. We can't avoid a decision. For just as someone was to fall overboard and a lifeboat was sent to rescue them, they have to make a choice. Do they trust that the lifeboat has been sent to save them and it's safe to get in? Or do they decide it's really a pirate ship masquerading as a lifeboat and stay in the water? There isn't a third option. As C.S. Lewis, one of the intellectual giants of the 20th century and most famous for being the author of the Narnia stories said, I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. Thirdly, the words we speak really matter. Speech is a much larger part of our lives than we realise. It's how we express who we are. And Jesus tells us here the immense importance of how we speak and how careful we need to be with our everyday words. Joyce Meyer, the Christian author, writes, every word we speak can either be a brick to build or a bulldozer to destroy. Now, what Jesus is saying should really search our hearts. How often have we used our words to hurt others? How often have we gossiped about others? I'm sure that all of us can think of words we wish we could take back or regret years later, or maybe are still even living with the consequences of. Our words are evidence of our state of heart. 
If people are listening to our words today, what is it revealing about us? So how can we put all this into practice? Well, let's start at the end with our words. First, changing the way we talk can only be done by changing our heart. And our heart will only be right when we allow the Holy Spirit to fill us with new attitudes and motives. Then our speech will be cleaned up at its source. Secondly, we can pray daily that our speech be full of grace, that we use words that are positive, that encourage and build people up. And thirdly, Nicky Gumbel, the pioneer of the Alpha Course, has a great mnemonic to help us. Nikki says, let's think before we speak. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? What a difference we could all make to those around us if we thought like that before we spoke. Secondly, are we gathering with Jesus? For those that have already made a decision to follow Jesus, he says in this passage that we must be totally on board with his mission of gathering people to him. And that means that wherever we are, at school, uni, work or anywhere we've been placed in life, God has given us the task of telling everybody about him. It's a big responsibility. It's urgent and we need to take it seriously. But it's not always easy. Many today are like the Pharisees and despite seeing the evidence, they just don't want to believe or change the way they live. Frank Turek, the Christian speaker, is always saying people are on a happiness quest, not a truth quest. However, one of the best tools that we have is the Alpha Course. It's a place that people can discuss what they think, ask questions and they can review the evidence. Our latest course at Maybridge started last week and it's not too late. If there's somebody you could invite along, it might just change their life. Thirdly, have we made a decision for Jesus? To be against Jesus is to be part of the losing side. For some of you, today may be the day that you decide to change sides, to follow Jesus. Jesus is the strongest strong man. He's not neutral about us. He loves us more than we can understand and he has the power to liberate us from everything that threatens to overwhelm us. Will you let him transform your life? I'm going to close in prayer with some spaces for silence, giving us a chance to all respond to what we've heard. Then if you'd like to give your life to Jesus today, I will finish with a prayer that you can echo in your heart. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We thank you that you have forgiven us everything we have done wrong and that if we willingly come to you, there is nothing that you will not forgive. Help us to be a part of your mission here on earth. Help us to bring this good news of the hope that you offer to all of those around us. Holy Spirit, please transform our hearts so that our words may always be a blessing to others. If you would like to give your life to Jesus, picture him standing before you now. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me so much, that you died for me, that I can be set free. I'm sorry for everything wrong I have done or said that has hurt you. If anything specific comes to mind, say it now. I ask you to come into my heart forever with your forgiveness, love and peace. Let me trust in your promise that if I ask, 
you will come into my life and be my saviour. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer or want to find out more about a personal relationship with Jesus, then please do contact the church office via the website at maybridge.org.uk forward slash contact. Thanks for listening. Jesus, Jesus, precious Lord, none on the earth or heavens above that I have found more beautiful. You are my treasure, my great reward. I just want to move your heart, it's all I want to do, I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you. Jesus, Jesus, my offering, all my ambitions, my hopes, my dreams, so here's my life, Lord, a sacrifice, oh, just to believe.
song give you praise God mm -hmm. oh am I waking am I sleeping every hour in between God To Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever and trust Him in His presence today. You have my heart, 
Thanks for watching. If you have any questions about what you've heard or anything at all for that matter, you can get in touch at info at maybridge.org.uk. We'd love to hear from you. If you're new to faith, it'd be brilliant uh, if you wanted to come along to our next Alpha course so you can explore life's big questions. Or if you're just new to us and you'd like to find out more um, and you want to get it connected in at Maybridge, let us make you dinner and get to know you. Um, we'd love to see you at our next newcomers meal. You can sign up for both of those things and also find out more about church life, groups, special events, anything and everything uh, to do with the world of Maybridge Community Church uh, by heading to maybridge.org.uk. We hope to see you soon.